Hi, everyone. Thank you for your patience while we navigated the audio issues. It sounds like um, from the, the chat and the questions people are submitting, it sounds like folks can hear us, so that's good. Um, thank you all for taking the time to join um, us for this webinar. We are thrilled to have um, Karen Pickering presenting today's webinar, which is Learning from Common Coding Errors. Um, I'm going to just run through a few housekeeping items. I think for those of you who have joined our webinars in the past, you're probably familiar with the process, but I know we always have a few new attendees. So um, everybody's in listen-only mode, which means you'll need to use your control panel to communicate. Looks like lots of you have figured that out already because I can see your questions and comments. Um, this is on the right-hand side of your screen. You can minimize it and, um, by collapsing and expanding the little red box on the arrow. Um, if you want to ask a question, you can do that in the questions section. Um, just type it in at any time, and we will save questions till the end and review them at that point. But anytime you have a question, feel free to submit it, and we will um, get to them at the end. Also, hopefully you all got handouts for today's presentation. Those were sent yesterday. Um, if you didn't get them, they're also in the handout section uh, in the control panel as well. So feel free to print those off and refer to them. And uh, lastly, we want to make sure you receive your CEU. So tomorrow morning, I'll be sending out an email to all attendees. It will have a link to a webinar evaluation. It's a very short evaluation. We ask that you complete it. Once you submit it, you can download your CEU certificate. If you have any questions or problems, um, feel free to reach out to me by respond responding to any of the emails you received about this webinar. Those will go to me, um, and I'll make sure you get what you need. So that covers the housekeeping, the logistics. Um, now I'd like to introduce you to Karen Pickering. Karen received her RHIT uh, certificate in 1990 and her CCS in 1994. She is proficient in ICD-10-CM, ICD-9-CM, CPT, HCPCS coding. Um, she has 32 years experience and, and she's an expert in coding, auditing, mentoring to healthcare facilities and HIM professionals. She performs comprehensive coding reviews to assure correct and compliant coding practices in a variety of healthcare settings including in, uh, acute inpatient and outpatient, rehab, partial hospitalization, and risk adjustment. She also helped create and is a content expert for the auditing software program ReviewMate by Pickerson Solutions. So we are thrilled to have Karen um, join us for a webinar today. And um, Karen, I'm going to hand it over to you. OK, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And welcome, everybody. Um, today we're going to talk about some common coding errors and um, basically here's our objectives. So this presentation is, is targeted towards auditors and coders and coding managers and what the objectives are would be for auditors or coding managers, um, we will be presenting some potential areas that you can focus on for coding audits possibly. Um, maybe provide some ideas for um, coder education if you're looking for some topics for coder education. And then just to bring this data to the table um, for comparative analysis, maybe in your facility you can compare if this looks like um, the common coding errors that you're seeing in your audits and in your facilities. And then for coders, um, the objectives would be to shine a light on these common coding errors uh, maybe to help alert you to what's going on out there in the industry with um, common coding errors to maybe allow you to um, identify when you're coding something that, oh, yeah, they mentioned that this is a high error area. So to kind of alert you to those things. And maybe um, the slides will give you some inspiration for further study in a certain um, area, a code, a code group that maybe you're, you're struggling with. And then um, I've provided a lot of reading material. Um, for coders also um, some educational areas that you could possibly walk away from this presentation having those um, objectives um, obtained there. And this is our agenda. I'm going to give a brief background of what ReviewMate is and where we got this data. I'm going to give a discussion of that data kind of quickly. And then I have three areas where I've provided 
the most common coding errors. So I, IPPS inpatient, and we're going to concentrate on that today, and we're going to actually dig into those common coding errors and give um, an in-depth root cause analysis of some of those coding errors um, for inpatient. At the end of the slide deck, you will see the most common coding errors for OPPS and PROFI. I've provided those for you. We're just not going to analyze them today due to, you know, time constraints. So you will have those at the end of the slide deck for your reference. Um, so a little background. Review makes a web-based software program for coding auditors to use. Um, the software it allow, the end user is actually the auditor and the coder, and it allows them to write up their findings and get automated accuracy rates and things like that. So currently, ReviewMate has um, IPPS, OPPS, ambulatory surgery, PROFI, and risk adjustment modules. So what we did is we took um, all of our clients' data for their coding audits and pulled this together. Um, the data set includes 13 of our clients, 11 of those are auditing firms, and there's one enterprise hospital group and one independent consultant. So that's where we, we gather this data from our 13 clients. It includes 306 hospitals. Um, the total coding reviews that we included here were 6,161. There are 666 reviewers and um, auditors included in this data, as well as over 5,000 coders. The total number of accounts in this data set is um, listed here. So three, just over 3,000 inpatient, 2,300 outpatient, and 701 profi. And the data set includes, included all this many diagnosis codes, this many procedure codes. So it's just to give you an idea that this is a, a very large um, group of data that we pulled this information from to give you the top 10 most common coding errors. And just to remember that this is aggregate data. We don't know the purpose of the reviews that were performed. We don't know what the sampling processes were. And every hospital has its own coding policy. So just a little disclaimer there for you that this is um, aggregate data that we pulled together. So let's talk about inpatient. So for the inpatient, these were the most the top 10 changed DRGs. So you can see at the top there, we have one, uh, 190 was the most common, um, commonly changed DRG. Um, septicemia, I think that nobody would probably be surprised that those, those would be the top DRG changes, but I was kind of surprised to see normal newborn on this list as number three, the third most changed DRG was um, 795. I thought that was kind of surprising, and we'll talk about why here in a minute. And then also, I thought 392. That was kind of surprising to me too. So these are your top 10 DRG changes. We are going to concentrate and analyze the top five today. So we're going to be talking about that 190 through 392 here. So this is a listing that you could use if you're wanting to maybe do some auditing on your coders. I mentioned that before. So this is the top 10 most commonly um, changed DRGs. So we'll talk about DRG 190 first. So 44%, um, so almost half of DRG 190 were changed to 189. Um, the uh, principal diagnosis being changed from J44 to J96. And 189 is a higher weighted DRG. So over the years, it's, it's about a 0.04225 higher weighted DRG um, that we're changing those 190s to. Um, so the other changes to one, um, 190 were um, changed into 193, which is simple pneumonia, um, 177 other respiratory infections, and 178 also. So those are some of the other revisions to DRG 190. So DRG 190, um, most of the, the citations that were cited in these coding audits were these three coding clinic articles. And every time I have a reference to some reading material or something educational, I've included our little picture here of our owl that um, will alert you that in, uh, that is a slide that contains some references and some possible reading material. So these are the um, coding clinics that were cited on the DRG changes from 190 
to a different DRG. So we have that third quarter 2016 coding clinic that states that J44 code should go first and the pneumonia um, goes secondary. And then over the years, this has changed and we're gonna kind of talk about that. So this DRG 198 has caused a lot of problems with um, coders out there. Um, first telling us that we had to use the J44 first and then they reversed that. And we're gonna talk about that here in a second. Um, the second coding clinic cited here is for ventilator associated um, and aspiration pneumonia that would be excluded from that rule that we talked about where the J44 has to go first. And then also the, ne the uh, third coding clinic cited here is that influenza uh, infections are excluded from that rule also. So in that was the previous rule that you had to put the J44 first. And now in for financial year 2018, starting October 1st, 2017, they actually changed the code book. And under J44 O, they changed use additional code to code also. And those are just seem like just small words there that are just being changed in the code book. But the ramifications of that change is huge because now that is telling us that we don't have to use the J44 first. We can use whatever um, we feel is appropriate for the principal diagnosis. So that's a huge change. So the takeaway for this DRG 190 is be aware of this difference and when it started. So before October 1st, 2017, um, you had to put the J44 first, but after that you didn't. So um, the differences here between use additional code and code also I've listed here from the coding guidelines. So the use additional code being changed to code also um, allows us to use pneumonia or bronchitis or something else first other than that J440. So um, for the auditors out there or the coding managers might be a good idea to pull some DRG 190s from after October 1st, 2017 and maybe check make sure that your coders are aware of the difference that occurred at that point in time. And the bottom line that we found with DRG 190 is that there's just a whole lot of querying going on on this because we need to know what the real reason for the admission is and which should be, which diagnosis should be assigned as principal. So we did see a lot of queries recommended for DRG 190. Um, the next uh, most commonly changed DRG was 871 for sepsis, and I have to tell you I'm not surprised by that. Um, we always struggle with sepsis. So this is um, this graph will show you what the uh, DRG 871 was changed to. So the largest one here is that 872, which doesn't surprise me. If we're taking away an MCC, we end up with 872. So that was one of the most common changes. And then the next one being the uh, a change to DRG 853, which is the OR procedure um, DRG. So that one's kind of surprising too, that we're possibly missing some OR procedures um, and having DRG 871 change to 853. So we'll dig into some of the reasons and the root causes behind these DRG changes in sepsis. 30% of these revisions were 871 to 872, um, with an MCC being removed. And I tried to find a trend here, um, if it was a certain MCC, and we really couldn't find a pattern there. So it's just a variety of, variety of MCCs being removed from this DRG, which is downgrading it to 872. So here we are with um, the different issues when there was a revision from um, 871 to 853. And the majority is that there was added procedures. So, and you can see in the examples here, the first part of this table, the variety of different procedures that were missed by the coders. So some of them are pretty significant, like a cardiac ablation. Uh, a bronchoscopy procedure, a BAL, nephrostomy insertion, removal of a port. So there's a, some different procedures listed here that the coder missed. And when that code was added, it changed the DRG to 853. So the takeaway here in the last column 
The takeaway here is to make sure that the coders are aware of what is an OR procedure and what isn't, and make sure that you're you're coding those procedures. They may seem insignificant, but sometimes they can change that DRG to 853. Um, another um, issue with this DRG change here is um, where the auditors had recommended uh, revision and root operations. So sometimes we saw inspection revised to drainage or extraction revised to excision. So the takeaway there is to know your root operations. So um, make sure that your root operation is correct and you know those definitions. Um, I actually have a, a set of flashcards from AHIMA. They have some flashcards that have the root operations on them. And I think it's really, really helpful. I, I keep them on my desk right there every day. So um, we'll help you to um, quick reference the root operation definition. And then the last issue with this particular sepsis DRG change is a revised seventh character for um, therapeutic versus diagnostic. And we saw a lot of these, and I actually have a coding clinic here from third quarter 2017. Notice our little owl character there. And um, you can reference this, and basically this coding clinic tells you that um, if a procedure is therapeutic and diagnostic, um, to use Z. So there was a lot of the, these affect this, that seventh character affects whether a code is going to be an o, considered an OR procedure or not. So that was a really, really important one too with this particular DRG change. Okay, and then um, a lot of these um, changes were due to a principal diagnosis of sepsis being revised um, for um, DRG 871. So and this brings up a good discussion with coders and auditors. So obviously our biggest slice of the pie here is that sepsis was ruled out. And we all know that if it gets ruled out, you can't code it. But the other, the, the next biggest um, slice of the pie, this 26% here, is that sepsis was only mentioned once. And so I think we see this a lot. And the doctor might say sepsis one time on like one progress note, and then he never says it again. He doesn't put it on the discharge summary. So that ends up being kind of an issue, and that's kind of a hot topic. So um, that's, if that comes up in your facility a lot, it, you know, it's probably a really good opportunity to query and get that clarified. Um, everybody's rules might be different on that. But we, find, we found that that was interesting, that the principal diagnosis of sepsis um, would be changed because a lot of people were saying if they only mentioned it once, you shouldn't be coding it. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, so the third most popular DRG change was that newborn, normal newborn that I was talking about. And that one was kind of a surprise. So very interesting that the large slice of the pie here is that DRG 795 for normal newborn was changed to neonate with significant problems. That was the majority of them. So um, we're really, um, to me, this kind of tells me as an auditor that maybe we're not reading the whole record and that we're not picking up on the other secondary conditions that the baby might have. So on analysis of this um, DRG 795, um, we found that um, the first part of this table is a change to 792 with prematurity. So the coder, the issue was that the coder missed the secondary diagnosis code for prematurity. And the takeaway would be, make sure you read the whole medical record, make sure that you're really getting the true picture of uh, the baby's condition. Um, the next DRG change would be 793, and that is a full-term neonate with major problems. So most of those that we found, it was, it was almost kind of shocking because it was a lot of hypoglycemia being missed. So these babies are having hypoglycemia, they're having it treated, but we're not coding it for some reason, we're not picking up on it. And then the most common one was a change from 795 to 794. And um, that was being, uh, Secondary diagnosis codes that were missed, like observation for suspected condition, meconium staining, maybe it's a murmur, um, SGA, small gestational age, TTN, 
nevus and respiratory distress. So these were among the things that we saw where the coder did not code that secondary condition and the DRG changed to 794. So just make sure you know the guidelines for secondary diagnosis codes for newborns. Um, it's the same as the inpatient guideline, but they add in there for newborns implications for future healthcare needs. So um, that's the coding guideline quotation there for you. Um, and I really just felt like um, with this particular situation with this DRG change that the it seems like the whole medical record is just not being reviewed. So that's a very important important um, DRG change there. So it's pretty significant. Okay, and then the fourth DRG, um, most common change DRG was 189. So um, revisions of DRG 189, I could not really find a trend in particular like the ones we've already discussed. So they were kind of all over the map. Um, some of the ones that I saw that were changed were to uh, 291 for heart failure, um, changed to a 190. Um, for COPD, and then a change to 193 for simple pneumonia. So to me, as an auditor, I would say that it's probably due to not picking up on the actual reason for admission, maybe, principal diagnosis changes. So the um, DRG change of 189 to 291, I saw two scenarios. It was either that the respiratory failure was attributed to the heart failure, so you have to put the heart failure first, because it, the way it was documented, it was attributed to the heart failure. The other scenario for this DRG change was um, the respiratory failure, CHF, hypertensive heart disease, all those things were co-equal and they all qualified as principal diagnosis. So the auditor was recommending a change to 291, which is higher. So when they all meet the definition of principal diagnosis, you can optimize at that point and choose the higher weighted DRG. So that's why we saw DRG changes from 189 to 291. The other um, changes to 189 is to 190, and that was for COPD. And we saw two scenarios for this one. We saw that respiratory failure was documented as due to another condition like COPD, emphysema, bronchiectasis, and so they are recommending that the underlying cause be the principal diagnosis. And then respiratory failure not documented or documented only once. So here we have that, that issue again, that it was only undocumented once, so I'm not going to code it, which that gets kind of a gray area there. So um, DRG 190 is a lower weighted DRG. Um, so this recommendation to change to a 190 results in a lower DRG, so the documentation must have been pretty compelling in, um, to make a downgrade to a DRG, in my opinion. So those were the scenarios that we saw for a DRG change from 189 to 190. And then the other DRG change that we saw here was a 189 to a 193. And this um, situation, um, we saw that pneumonia and respiratory failure were both documented and qualified for principal diagnosis. And 193 is a higher weighted DRG. So at that point, um, you can optimize that DRG and go ahead and choose the 193. So this, kind, this category kind of tells me that maybe we're not optimizing when we should be. Um, and getting that higher weighted DRG. If the principal diagnosis and the documentation allow, we should be doing that. Okay, and then um, I think this is the last DRG that change that we're gonna talk about is the DRG 392 for esophagitis gastroenteritis. And we have a lot going on here on this pie graph. This is not as cut and dried as some of the other ones. Um, the majority of the changes were um, other diagnosis with a CC, the 24% slice of the pie here. And um, we're, we're going to be talking about all these categories here um, and kind of digging into why we're having so many DRG changes of uh, 392. Um, a, a DRG change from 392 to 394 um, was very common, was the most common change in this category. And there were two scenarios that we saw. We saw 
that um, a very nonspecific colitis gastroenteritis diagnosis code was changed to something more specific like ischemic or toxic. So um, using those nonspecific non codes um, should kind of alert a coder to say, to dig a little more and make sure that it wasn't described further as a specific type of gastroenteritis or colitis. And then the other scenario was um, a nonspecific GI condition was actually post-procedural and was a, should have been a complication code, like an ostomy malfunction or a post-procedural constipation, nausea, vomiting, that kind of thing. So it, the patient would have the condition, but it was attributed to something else, either a complication or a procedure. So we should be using that as the principal diagnosis rather than just the um, the GI condition. So um, DRG 394, um, this other digestive system diagnosis is higher weighted. So we really need to make sure that we get that condition coded as principal diagnosis when it's documented to more specific causes and not just saying gastroenteritis or something like that. So staying away from non-specific uh, non codes is kind of the takeaway here and making sure that you're getting, you're coding the root cause of the patient's symptoms. Um, we saw a 392, DRG 392 changed to 391 also a lot. Um, there were a variety of MCCs that were added to these, um, to change the DRG. So I listed some of them here just for interest, um, severe malnutrition, a, a STEMI, myocardial infarction, ischemic bowel. So there was a lot of different um, uh, reasons and different conditions that were added to these DRGs that would um, be an MCC and make it, you know, get that higher weighted DRG. I think this should say 391 here. It's 391 is a higher weighted DRG. And then I thought this was interesting. This threw me kind of a little threw me for a loop here. We got a 392 change to a 74, a cranial and peripheral nerve disorders. And I thought that was really strange. And we saw a lot of those. But then when we dig into the root cause, it kind of made sense. So these were cases, um, diabetics with gastroparesis. So they were being coded to the K code for gastroparesis. But Technically, gastroparesis in a diabetic codes to the E11 code, so that's what should be the principal diagnosis. So that's a good um, takeaway there, too, um, to make sure that you're doing your diabetic coding correctly and that gastroparesis um, should not, the K code should not be the principal diagnosis. It should be the E11 code. Okay. So that's all, that was all of the top five DRG changes that we saw in the data. And now I'm going to go ahead and talk about the top um, five revised principal diagnosis codes. So here's the listing of the most commonly changed principal diagnosis for inpatient. Um, I don't think it would be anybody's surprise to see A419 sepsis as the first one, the most common mistake. Um, with principal diagnosis is sepsis. And then we have pneumonia, we have COPD, cerebral infarction, and, and um, gastrointestinal hemorrhage. And that one surprised me too. Why would we have so many problems with K92 too? So I thought that was kind of uh, surprising to see that as one of the top diagnosis code change or principal diagnosis code changes. So these are your top 10. You can use this list to do some auditing or do some education. We are going to concentrate on the first five here and really dig into those and find out what's going on. So sepsis, this is how overwhelming the sepsis revisions were. Um, A419 um, had a dramatic, dramatically higher number of revisions than any, any other code in the, in the data. So it's kind of interesting. Okay, so the, um, this is what we saw when we um, dug into the sepsis revision, that the majority of the time it was specificity. So kind of not a surprise there. Um, 
All the other reasons here, we see specificity. We see that sepsis was not documented or was only documented once. Here we are again with documented once. Um, sepsis changed to a complication code. Sepsis was ruled out. Sepsis not present on admission. And then sepsis not the focus of care. So those were some of the reasons that we saw. When it comes to specificity, um, it was probably pretty plain for people to uh, know that it was the organism that wasn't picked up. So E. coli, Klebsiella, strep, staph, all of those, we were using a non-specific CPT code when in actuality the documentation did show an organ organism. Um, and here's some citations for you for um, some coding clinic um, references here that you can dig into on this subject. Um, sepsis due to E. coli. UTI, you can go ahead and assume the E. coli is also um, attributable to the sepsis. So um, these are some good coding clinics to read. And the second coding clinic goes over all kinds of different uh, infectious diseases and how to code sepsis when they have these particular viruses or other bacterial diseases. So those are some good citations to review. And what, once again, I just kind of wanted with this slide that sepsis is not documented or only documented one time and never confirmed. Um, something to discuss possibly at your facility of how to handle this. How are, if, if they say sepsis one time, are we going to code it? Are we going to query it? Like, what are we going to do with the situation? It seems to be pretty common out there. And then other sepsis revisions we saw. Um, sepsis changed to a complication code, so maybe ventilator-associated pneumonia, catheter-associated UTI, um, vascular catheter, bloodstream infection. So whenever they have sepsis due to any of these situations with um, either a mechanical catheter or ventilator, you have to be using the complication code and then the A41 code. So you want to make sure that you are coding the complication code as principal diagnosis. And here's the citation to the guideline that actually specifies this um, particular um, guideline and how to code that situation. Um, the next, the second um, most commonly um, changed principal diagnosis is pneumonia. And what we mostly saw was revisions to a more specific kind of pneumonia. So aspiration, um, you know, necrotizing pneumonia, lobar, post-op. So all these different kinds of pneumonia were not picked up by the coder. They were just coding to plain old pneumonia. And um, if you have this, a more specific type, you should definitely try to code it to that more specific code. Um, the, a citation here for you is the third quarter 2018 that talks about low bar pneumonia. So that, that was a lot of the problems with low bar pneumonia. There is actually a code for that. You can use that code now. Um, so that was one of the most common changes of principal diagnosis of J189. Um, a lot of the revisions to pneumonia were re revised to the J44 category, and I already kind of talked about that with DRG190, so um, it's kind of the same situation, that pneumonia COPD problem with which one do we put as principal diagnosis that uh, changed in 2018. So um, I won't reiterate that. We kind of talked about it already. But um, as of October 1st, 2017, it's OK to use the pneumonia if it qualifies. So just to remember that. Sometimes the pneumonia was um, revised to a different respiratory process, like respiratory failure, asthma, bronchitis, CHF, um, and different, different respiratory processes that were um, present. and um, were recommended for principal diagnosis change. Um, the most common revision was to respiratory failure. So in these, we saw that both COPD and respiratory failure were um, co-equally causing the admission. So people that were placed on ventilators in the ER and things like that. So the reason for admission appeared to be the respiratory failure and not the COPD exacerbation. And I think this is one of the biggest challenge for coders in these 
very complex respiratory situations where um, you can't, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg. So they have respiratory failure, but they also have a COPD condition. It's kind of difficult sometimes to determine what you should be using for principal. So usually um, the respiratory failure results in a higher weight of DRG, um, <clears throat> not all the time. And that doesn't mean you should use it as principal diagnosis every single time. Every situation is different, but just determining what the reason for admission is and using that as the principal diagnosis. Another revision we saw to J44 ones was emphysema. So here's those coding clinics. I think before these coding clinics came out, coders, we kind of, we would see emphysema and COPD and we'd think, ah, oh, we just code the COPD. Now when we see emphysema, we have to use that J43 code. So that's a big change in, um, in coding there. So um, this would be a good area to focus some reviews on also to pull cases with J44 codes and make sure that emphysema wasn't documented because that's going to change your coding pretty drastically. Um, other revisions to COPD exacerbation um, is to pneumonia, to sepsis, to influenza, and CHF. So um, when you have an underlying cause or something um, more significant to be your principal diagnosis, if it qualifies, that, um, that accounted for the principal diagnosis code changes to J44. And then we're on to the next principal diagnosis code change that was common, which is I639 cerebral infarction. And as you can see from the, the pie graph here, we have 68% um, of those were changed to a more specific um, stroke code. So um, the actual type of stroke or maybe the location was documented, but the coders were not coding to that specificity. So here are some of them that we saw. So we have hemorrhage, we have embolism, thrombosis, stenosis, occlusion, lacunar, and other. So we have all these specific kinds of strokes that were documented, but the coders were not picking up on that. Um, the specificity of a stroke can be taken from radiology reports. And my takeaway from this was that coders need to do a little more digging in the record to look, try to locate the type of stroke. So here's your um, coding clinic citations for strokes that would be appropriate to review in regards to um, cerebral infarction. Um, there's two new codes that went into effect October 1st, 2018, um, I-6381, I-6389, which is other, and then lacunar infarction. So being aware of these new codes coming up and realizing that maybe the physicians are going to be documenting these types of um, strokes and that you should try to code um, those if they're documented. Other things that we saw in regards to revisions to cerebral infarction, um, we saw maybe the CVA was ruled out and they really didn't know the cause of the patient's symptoms. So the CVA was, should have not been coded and it should have been coded to a symptom code. We saw um, that the CVA was ruled out and that there was some other neurological disorder going on, like a TIA or Bell's palsy kind of thing. And then um, a lot of times the, C the CVA principal diagnosis was revised to a completely unrelated um, condition um, according to the reason for admission. So the, pa the patient did have a stroke, but maybe they, that wasn't the focus of the care. So we saw those revisions also. And then my favorite was K92-2, um, GI bleeding. So we have a principal diagnosis code being changed, um, K92-2. And the majority, 61% of those were a change to a combo code um, to like gastritis or ulcer or some other GI condition with bleeding. So that was our most common um, change to K92-2. It's um, the coding clinic that I'm, the coding guideline that I'm quoting here on this screen um, is, has such big ramifications to um, coding and, and actually to this presentation, and you'll see this over and over again with me putting this guideline up there. 
And this is a guideline that talks about with or in. And we are being told to interpret that to be associated with or due to. So if you're a seasoned coder, you remember back in the days before this guideline, we used to never assume relationship between um, conditions, but now we're actually able to do that. So if you have the word with or in anywhere in the tabular or the index of the codebook, you can go ahead and use the combination code and go ahead and assume that relationship. So let's talk a little bit about that. So most of the GI conditions that were changed from K922 were to very specific conditions with bleeding. So here's a coding clinic citation um, to go ahead and read there in regards to this. And here's some of those conditions. So we saw um, gastric duodenal esophageal ulcers with bleeding, gastri gastritis duodenitis with bleeding. So you see the pattern here. Um, whenever the patient has the GI bleeding and they get diagnosed with one of these conditions, it's okay to go ahead and use the combination code. If the physician specifically states the bleeding was not due to the condition, then uh, yes, you should keep them separate. But if they don't say that, it's okay to go ahead and use the combination code. Other revisions to K922 um, change to a more specific GI bleeding code. So um, sometimes it was it's more appropriate to use rectal bleeding, melana, hematemesis, something like that, rather than just this kind of generic GI bleeding unspecified code. So if they have a specific kind of bleeding, you should go ahead and code to that. And then sometimes there was an underlying cause that just for some reason didn't get coded. We're just coding the bleeding. So we actually saw some cases where the bleeding was identified as coming from a cancer or coming from an ulcer or something like that. So the K92-2 unspecified would not be appropriate in that case. You should use the underlying cause of what they actually diagnosed. So that was our top um, top 10 principal diagnosis code changes, and now we'll move on to top 10 revised secondary diagnoses. And I thought this was very surprising. Our number one changed secondary diagnosis code is I-10, hypertension. So I thought that was kind of fascinating. Um, we have diabetes here, we have anemia, we have acute renal failure and pneumonia. And then we have this total list of 10 here for you to use to do some auditing or do some education. So we're going to talk about the top, the top five here and kind of dig into what the problems were for these secondary diagnosis codes. Okay, so I-10. What is going on with I-10? So it was what I suspected when I saw that, that we're um, revising I-10 to the, either the I-11, I-12, or I-13. So this is your hypertensive heart disease that we can now go ahead and use the combination code even if the physician has not linked the hypertension to the heart disease. So that's the majority of your changes here to I-10. But I also found some other interesting things in this category too. I kind of expected to see the I-11, I-12, I-13 problem because it's kind of a newer, um, newer code. Um, coding guideline there, so I kind of not surprised to see that, but I was really surprised to see redundant code deleted, and I'm thinking, what is happening? So that was kind of interesting. Here's your um, coding guideline for that hypertensive heart disease, hypertensive CKD, and all of those. So if the physician documents that the conditions are unrelated to the hypertension, then you can code them. Do not use the combination code, but it, it seems like we're still missing this. We're still having problems with I-10 and going ahead and using the combo code when they have heart disease or kidney disease. So um, the number one, um, the item number one on this uh, slide, um, showing you that the in the guidelines, you assume a relationship when codes I-50 or I-51 for heart disease is also assigned. So that's kind of an important one there to, to remember that if you're coding a code from the I-50 or I-51 ranges that are listed here, 
and the patient has hypertension, you should be using the combination code for the hypertension and not the I-10. That's what sometimes that gets missed. Um, this, this is very interesting to me. The second most common error for this category of I-10 is the removal of I-10 when I-11, 12, or 13 were also assigned. And I, I don't really know the root cause of that, but I, I'm curious to kind of throw it out there to people that maybe it's computer-assisted coding. Maybe we're seeing the I-10, we're also coding the I-11, and we're forgetting to remove the I-10. So that was like kind of, kind of um, enlightening to me, like, wow, so it must be computer-assisted coding, I don't know. But um, when you're coding I-10 and I-11, obviously you don't need the I-10 anymore. So I thought that was interesting. The second um, diagnosis code revision that most popular that we saw was E11-9, so that's diabetes uncomplicated. Um, once again, kind of not surprised to see that um, most of the revisions were to diabetes with a complication, um, diabetes with kidney disease, th that kind of thing, instead of just plain old E11-9 diabetes uncomplicated. Once again, this is the same issue as the I-10. The most common error was removing E11-9 because in the code list, we did code uh, diabetic CKD, diabetic neuropathy, diabetic retinopathy, whatever it was. We did code a combination code for the complications, but we also were tacking on this E11-9, which is not necessary. So once again, I don't know, but I, I almost think that it might be computer-assisted coding that's causing the problem here. Um, the second and third most common error was the revision to a complication code. So here's your coding guidelines um, citation here. And once again, we have this with or in. So when we see with or in used in the tabular or the index, we can go ahead and make that assumption that it's okay to um, use the combination code for the diabetic complication. So that's what that citation is. Um, so these were some of them. We had um, a revision of E11-9 to E10 because the documentation said type 1. Uh, most of them were changes to E11-2 for kidney conditions, E11-3, um, 4, and 5 for the different ophthalmic and neurological and circulatory conditions. And then we had some others which were hypo and hyperglycemia, arthropathy, and ulcers. So these Di these diabetic complications were documented, but we did not code them. We just coded E11-9. So that's an important one there. Um, here are some coding clinic um, articles that were cited in these um, for these uh, common coding changes for diabetes. So this will help with doing some research and reading up on this and um, a little help there with the coding clinics. Um, other revisions to E11-9, um, sometimes we would see the diabetes was documented as a past history, and you could see that they, you know, a lot of people think that diabetes will never go away, but sometimes it can. So maybe the patient lost a lot of weight, uh, maybe they stopped taking steroids, so their diabetes went away, or maybe they had bariatric surgery. So sometimes if you see diabetes, it could possibly be that it's not present anymore. So just to be aware of that. Um, another common change we saw was um, that it was not diabetes that the patient had. It was pre-diabetes. So there's a code for pre-diabetes. So we want to make sure that if that's what the patient has, we're not giving them the E11-9 code. We're giving them the pre-diabetes code. And then we saw a lot of... Um, removing of E11-9 from the case because it wasn't documented, so. Okay. So the next um, most common um, code and secondary diagnosis is anemia. So we have D64-9, which is anemia unspecified, and you can see that 35% of the changes to secondary diagnosis code of anemia was to anemia of a chronic disease the D63 category. So 
Um, that was the most common error. And then we have also redundant code coming up again, which I thought was interesting. So let's talk about anemia coding. Um, once again, we have the most common error was a change from D64 to D63. And those are your anemias in either cancer, anemia in CKD, or anemia of chronic disease. So I've highlighted here on this slide the word in. We have this word in again. So this is that guideline that tells us that the word with and the word in are going to allow you to make the assumption and use the combination code. So it's fine. And so once again, I, I put the slide again. So it's kind of a recurring theme here. We have with or we have in in this coding guideline. So we're, we're good to go. We can code the combination code of anemia in neoplastic disease, anemia in CKD. So going ahead and making that assumption is OK because of this guideline. Um, the second most common error was the removal of unspecified anemia because we also coded a specific kind of anemia. So we don't need that. Once again, making the assumption that it may be computers, uh, CAT coding that's doing this to us, not sure. But the D649 is not necessary. If you also have a specific kind of anemia coded already, like acute blood loss or iron deficiency anemia or something like that, you don't need to have this D649 code there. Um, this one was interesting. Oh, let me go back. This was interesting too for um, the changes to anemia. Um, sometimes in the in the cases, the auditors were seeing that acute blood loss or iron deficiency anemia were specifically diagnosed and documented by a provider, but it wasn't the attending provider. So maybe it was like the GI guy on the op report mentions a specific kind of anemia. Um, there is actually a coding clinic first quarter 2014 that addresses this situation and states that if a spe uh, specificity is documented by a non-attending provider, you can go ahead and code it as long as there's no um, conflict in the documentation by the attending. So if a consultant gives you something very, very specific for a code, you're totally fine to use that and use the, the very uh, specific diagnosis code, as long as the attending doesn't come along and say something completely different. In that case, you may want to query or go with the attending. So you're covered by this coding clinic article here to go ahead and use specificity that is documented by someone other than the attending. So that's what we saw in, uh, for anemia. The next um, most common di secondary diagnosis code changes were acute renal failure. And the most common one here, 44% of the time, the um, acute renal failure was changed to principal. So um, we have sequencing problems with acute renal failure. There are some coding clinics that I'll show you here that um, will help with that. Um, the second most common change here was um, being re this nonspecific N17.9 being changed to N17.0, so ATN, acute tubular necrosis. So the resequencing of um, N17.9, um, most of those resequencing cases involved dehydration, which we know AKI and dehydration is very difficult to code. Um, and then some of the times it was changed to hyponatremia hypokalemia, syncope, or UTI. Um, so those were the most common changes to that code. Um, here are some coding guidelines um, and a two coding clinic articles that will help with the coding and the sequencing of N179. So these will um, help with what should I put first. There's some coding clinics that specifically tell you what to use in those situations where the patient's dehydrated and has um, acute kidney injury or failure. Um, the, as I stated, the, sec, the um, one of the most common changes to N179 was to N170, which is ATN, 
acute tubular necrosis. So um, this would be documented by the nephrologist sometimes, just the nephrologist, because the nephrologist is going to be more focused on the kidney function. And so sometimes the nephrologist is going to say it very specifically, but the attending may not pick up on it in their documentation. So you can go ahead and code that um, based on that coding clinic that we talked about before, where if a consultant says something, you can go ahead and code it as long as the attending is in disagreement that you can't. But most of the time they're not. So an ATN is a very, very different um, disease process than acute kidney failure. So um, I learned that, that by doing some CDI projects that ATN is, has a completely different course and a completely different uh, set of lab values and every, I mean, it's just a completely different disease process. So it's really important that if we do see ATN, we want to make sure that we code it. This was a funny one. I thought this, this was um, kind of interesting. And I saw it several times, believe it or not, that um, the documentation is showing ARF, but we don't, that's kind of, there's a lot of things that could be ARF. So the coders were misconstruing that to be acute renal failure, when in reality, the doctor was talking about, about acute respiratory failure and acute rehab facility. So they were saying, I'm going to discharge the patient to ARF, meaning acute re rehab facility, but the coder took that and just ran with it and coded acute renal failure. So we have to be really careful with abbreviations, and it seems like with the EMR, um, I see in my auditing a lot of strange abbreviations that I don't know what they mean. They're not a common abbreviation. So we have to be really, really careful with, with that. And the last one is secondary diagnosis code change is to pneumonia, J189. This is, once again, you see a pattern here, a lot of unspecified codes when in reality we could probably be coding them to something more specific. So here we have um, the biggest category is that the pneumonia was ruled out, so we shouldn't be coding it at all. And then we see a specific organism. Um, and we see some resequencing re with pneumonia. So the most common revision of J189 was J181 low bar pneumonia. So it's kind of a newer um, coding clinic. So here's the citation of the coding clinic um, that if they do say low bar pneumonia, you can go ahead and use the specific code that's been provided for that condition. Um, so another one that we see is pneumonia being mentioned as a differential diagnosis by the doctor, and then it gets dropped. And so I'm sure if anybody that's a coder, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and so it's really, really difficult to know, did they, did they have it? Did they not have it? Did, why did they drop it? If the patient got really, really sick with something else, sometimes they drop a diagnosis and stop mentioning it. So here's a coding guideline. Um, to help with that situation where the suspected likely or questionable diagnoses um, can be coded and most likely a query may be in order, especially we do see where the doctor in the ER is saying possible pneumonia and then the attending doesn't even mention it. So it's, 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 it, uh, it's a very big challenge for coders, I understand that. So um, that was a common, a common problem that we saw. Okay, so that was your top five um, secondary diagnosis code changes, and here are your top 10 revised PCS codes. So um, this is a listing you can use to do some reviews or do some education. I was quite surprised by this because look at the number one uh, PCS code error that we're making. That's, what, that's just the upper GI, that's an, um, an endoscopy. And I'm thinking, why? What's the problem? That's really odd. I did not expect to see um, a GI scope as the most commonly changed PCS procedure code. That was kind of surprising to me. And then further down the line, you see um, our PIC line, um, endotracheal intubation. I expected to kind of see those, but I was quite surprised by the first one here. So let's talk about that one. The revisions to your inspection of the upper intestinal tract, most of those were 
changed to a more definitive procedure. So I was really surprised by that. The second category was that the inspection code was not needed. So you don't need to code the scope inspection if something more definitive also happened in, in the um, course of the procedure. So let's talk about that a little more too. So here we have um, some of the issues. Um, the first issue was that inspected inspection was coded, but a definitive procedure was performed. So they had an EGD with a biopsy or an EGD with control of hemorrhage, something like that. But the coder coded inspection and didn't get the, the more definitive procedure like the biopsy or the control of hemorrhage. And here's your coding clinics um, that will help support um, and educate um, for this situation. Um, the next issue was inspection code was not needed. So some of the examples are PEG, a PEG insertion with the EGD, um, where they're verifying the, play, the placement with the EGD, an EGD used during uh, ruin Y surgery, um, or an EGD just done with, with the more pr definitive procedure. And here's your PCS guideline that helps support that. Um, some, another issue we saw with this was it wasn't a full EGD, only the stomach or the esophagus was visualized. And here's a coding guideline that will help with that too. Um, we saw that the scope was not even documented and it got removed, which is curious. Um, we have an incorrect body part was coded. Um, so it was an ERCP or an MRCP. It wasn't an EGD. It was a different body part. Um, and then the more um, resequencing to a more definitive procedure. Um, the next category we see is, and I'm just going to back up real quick on this one before I move on. So I think the takeaway here is to make sure that you're reading your EGD report and actually coding the definitive procedures and not just seeing that an EGD was done and just coding it. So just be more careful with that. The next category is our pick insertions, our line insertions. And this particular code is for the internal jugular vein. And this one is continually being re um, recommended for revision to reflect the final resting um, location of the tip of the catheter. So even though they're going through the internal jugular vein, we're supposed to be coding the final resting place of the tip. And it's usually the vena cava, the superior vena cava, or the right atrium. And there's your coding clinic citations to help with this situation. So I see this a lot in my auditing, where we're just coding where they inserted it, but we really need to know the final resting place of the actual catheter. So here's just a little picture that shows that they insert it, and then they're usually advancing it all the way into very, very near the heart. So we need to get that final resting place of the tip here, not where it entered the skin, maybe in the chest or in the neck or something like that. We want to get this actual tip um, resting place. And a lot of times in the op reports, they don't even say anything about that. They're not super concerned about it, but a lot of times they do a follow-up chest x-ray. They, they actually should be doing a, a follow-up chest x-ray where you can find where the tip of the catheter ended up. So that's a good tip for you to check the the post procedure chest x ray, if you cannot find the, the resting place of the tip. Um, when it comes to um, the next category, is the, the insertion of an endotracheal tube. Um, and 75% of the revisions to this PCS code um, be, is because the intubation occurred in surgery as part of a surgery, or maybe they got intubated before they actually arrived in the ER. So a lot of um, recommendations to remove this code. You shouldn't be coding it if they got intubated before admission or in surgery. So um, the remaining revisions, um, other than those that were being asked for um, to remove, is the a character eight, um, changing the um, one, two, three, four, fifth character from a seven, to an eight, because most of the time we see that the intubations being performed um, are using a laryngoscope. So if they're using a laryngoscope, 
you're supposed to be using the fifth character of eight endoscopic. So here is the, um, the citation of the approach via natural or artificial opening endoscopic. So they are actually using a scope to help them insert that tube. So you should be using the scope um, fifth character there. Karen. Yes. Excuse me, this is Sharon. I just wanted to um, interject because we're running a little over and I, I think a couple people are dropping off maybe to head to other meetings. So I just wanted to let folks know um, there are some questions. Would you be open to maybe answering them offline and then we can respond to the individuals? Um, yeah, that's fine. Okay, all right, great, I thank you. I apologize, I thought we had till 3.30. I'm so sorry. No worries. <laughs> Um, I'm almost to the end, so shall I just jump to the end, or what would you like me to do? Oh, it's totally up to you. I mean, I think I can see lots of questions pouring in, so I guess people are definitely um, interested in what you're saying. I didn't catch folks that had to jump. Okay, okay. I'll try to move quickly and get to the end. So um, no this, this procedure code, um, most of the revisions to this code were due to lack of documentation. So. Um, this is because they're either not doing the chest x-ray and they can't verify the tip where the tip of the catheter was. So um, most of the revisions to this were just people um, recommending this get removed because they can't, they don't know where the tip is residing. So that's what that one was for. And the last one is um, the excision of the stomach endoscopic. So this would be a biopsy of the stomach during a GI procedure, and 81% of these revisions were a change in the body part, the fourth character, because the documentation is saying that they took a biopsy from the pylorus. And if you look at the ICD-10 PCS body part key, the pylorus goes to the stomach, so, or the antrum, I'm sorry, the antrum of the stomach. So a lot of people missing this fact that if they are going to do a biopsy of the pylorus, you should be coding it to antrum. Um, and then the remaining of those revisions were removal of this code to do a lack of documentation, but that they didn't do a biopsy. So these last few slides, um, this is where the slides start with outpatient, and these are just listings for you to see what the top 10 um, diagno or CPT code, APC code, all the different top most common coding changes that we saw in our data. And so these are listings that you can use to, uh, you know, like I said, do some education, do some auditing maybe, um, and so these lists for you to prove um, yourself and use those if you want to. Um, we also have some for Profi. So we have the top changed uh, CPT and diagnosis codes in the Profi arena. And that's it. Um, the, you can get your CE your credits, like Cheryl said, um, yeah, and um, I will take the questions offline, I guess, and we will be able to answer those, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for putting this slide up at the end, too. Um, so for folks on the line, I will be sending out an email tomorrow morning, and that will have the link to this recording. It will have instructions for obtaining your certificate, um, and we are going to be recording this, and, or we are recording it, and we'll be posting it, so um, for people that are viewing this recording, that's really what this slide is for, it's um, the instructions for obtaining your CEU, and you need to just type it into you um, into the URL box, um, and note that TrueCode does not have an email on True, so um, just make sure you put it in correctly, otherwise you'll get an error. Um, but I want to thank everybody for joining, and I apologize for the audio issues that were encountered. Um, so if you did have some issues in the beginning, um, like I said, we will be sending out the recording, so hopefully you can catch anything you missed. Um, and Karen, thank you so much. We got we got a lot of questions, so um, people were super interested in this topic, I think, and um, we really appreciate you sending for us.
Well, thank you for Thanks giving me everyone. the opportunity. Have a great I really afternoon. appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.